Welcome to this online lesson asking the question, what causes of disease were believed in the Renaissance? Our aims are to use the case of Charles II's illness to learn about Renaissance beliefs about disease and illness, and to investigate the work of Thomas Sydenham. Here's a do now task. Based upon what you know about other advancements and changes during the Renaissance, do you think that medicine would have got better or worse or stayed the same during this period? Explain your judgment, whatever it is. If you've not yet done any work on the Renaissance, I'd recommend you look at my previous lesson where I introduced the main themes of Renaissance progress. Anyway, pause the video here if you're going to have a go at that do now task. So, what did we think? Well, probably there were going to be some improvements, so that doesn't mean that things would stay the same. However, when it comes to the causes of disease, there were very few improvements in the understanding of both how diseases worked and how they were caused. And so actually, if there is going to be any change during this period, it's likely to be pretty small. We're going to start today's lesson by looking at a case study, the illness and death of this man, Charles II. On the 16th of February 1685, Charles II was suddenly taken ill. Twelve doctors tried to save his life. You know what they say about too many cooks, well perhaps this is a case of too many doctors. Your task is to take on the role of one of these doctors and suggest appropriate treatments. You will have a series of choices that are based on the actual treatments given to Charles. Once you've chosen your treatment, you should describe or explain exactly why you've chosen that one based upon your understanding of medical ideas at the time. And I will also tell you which choice was actually taken and why they probably took that particular course of action. So let's have a look at the story of Charles's illness now. Decision number one. These accounts are taken from what was recorded at the time. The doctors took very detailed notes as to how the king's illness uh, progressed, which is hardly surprising given that they were working on the basis of Hippocrates' clinical observation and diagnosis, where such things were recommended. So here's the start. February the 2nd. At eight in the morning, the king collapses. For two hours, his servants have known he is ill. As he is being shaved, he gives a terrible shriek and falls unconscious. Immediately, his physicians are called. What do you recommend to your fellow doctors? Number one, opening a vein in the king's arm to bleed 16 ounces of blood. That is quite a lot. Number two, call in Mistress Holder, who treated the king's poisoned hand five years ago successfully. Three, do nothing and see what happens. Or four, ask for an x-ray to be taken. Okay, so first task, record the king's symptoms. All right, which particular choice did you go with? You should have gone with this one if you were thinking like a Renaissance doctor. So record this actual treatment. And then explain which medical theory this is based upon. Okay, pause the video here and complete your notes on decision number one. So we should have identified that opening a vein in the king's arm to bleed 16 ounces of blood is related to the idea of the theory of the four humours, an incredibly ancient idea coming from ancient Greece in fact. And so this is not evidence that there had been much, shall we say, progress in health. Let's move on to decision number two. Surprisingly enough, this didn't really work. Within an hour, there was no improvement in the king's health. What treatment should the doctors attempt next? What are you going to recommend to your fellow doctors? Again, you're thinking like a Renaissance doctor at this part of time. Firstly, bleed the king again. Secondly, give more time for the first bleeding to work, so you just wait and see. Purge the king by giving him pills that will empty his bowels. Or fourthly, just pray. So, firstly, which treatment did you choose and was it based upon the th their first treatment? Choose one now and record it. You can pause the video while you do this. So, which treatment did you choose? Well, the actual thing that they did was they bled the king again. They thought that the first bleeding couldn't have been enough as it hadn't improved his state of health. But also, they purged the king by giving him pills to empty his bowels. It's not a very nice image, but what you've got to imagine here is a king who's been weakened by having lots of his blood taken and he's had to go to the toilet a lot. I'm pretty sure they would have done some praying too. All right, so record the actual treatments now. Note that there are two of them. 
And thirdly, explain which medical theory these are based upon. Pause the video while you complete those follow-up tasks. Done? Well, we should have identified that these decisions are based upon the theory of the four humours again. Not only are they trying to balance his blood, but also to try and balance his other humours through the use of a laxative. Decision number three. Some of the King's courtiers think that the doctors aren't doing enough and insist on another treatment. So some panic appears to be uh, creeping in here. What are the doctors going to do? Give the king more pills and purge him some more. Tell the servants that you are the experts and you know exactly what you are doing. That you need to shut their mouths. Smear pigeon droppings on the soles of the king's feet. Or shave the king's head and put burning tongs on his scalp to blister the skin. Nice. Okay, so which treatment did you choose? Remember you might have to choose more than one here. And was it based upon their first treatment? Or are they trying something new or just kind of carrying on in the same way? Pause the video and choose the treatment or treatments that you would recommend now. So what they actually did was the last two. Yes, they smeared pigeon droppings on the soles of the king's feet. They also shaved the king's head and put burning tongs on his scalp to blister the skin. So record those actual treatments and then explain which medical theory or theories these are based upon. Pause the video now. Well, it is likely that these theories are also linked to the balancing of the humours. The blisters on the head would have been believed to be filled with humours, probably yellow bile. However, the pigeon droppings one is a little bit less clear. There were different theories about drawing out poisons from the body by putting unpleasant or strong smelling things on the person. So the strong smell of the pigeon guano or droppings might have been related to the theory of miasma as well. And this idea of keeping bad air or smells away from the king with an even stronger smell. But it is not entirely clear. What is clear though is that these things are going to cause the king significant discomfort. At best they're going to do nothing, at worst they're going to make him a whole lot worse. Decision number four. The king can speak again but there is no other improvement. Everyone is growing worried. Then the king has another attack, faints and falls unconscious. I'm sure there's a real sense of panic settling in now. So what do you recommend to your fellow doctors? Do you call a wise woman and give the king a herbal remedy? Do you bleed the king again, this time opening two veins and hoping that this will work? Do you give the king some, some more of the sacred tincture that you used before, which will keep his bowels completely empty? Uh, these are the purgative pills that we were talking about earlier. Or do you leave the palace as swiftly as possible, saying that you have other patients to attend to? Probably not wanting to, to take responsibility for the king's illness. So your tasks. Firstly, describe the king's symptoms or progress. Is he getting better or worse? What's happened to him? And then what treatments do you recommend? Pause the video while you select those. Okay, well here's what the doctors actually did. They bled the king again. Yes, they're taking even more blood from him and they're giving him some more of that sacred tincture. So record the actual treatments and again, which medical theories are these based upon? Pause the video while you complete this. By this point, you really should be getting rather fed up and tired of writing down the theory of the four humours. So again, this suggests to us that actually they hadn't really come up with many new ideas. Let's have a look at the next decision. Decision five. The king slept all night and into the morning. Finally, some good news. The king is much better when he wakes. The worst seems to be over, but in the afternoon, he has another attack. Okay, speaking from a modern perspective right now, probably the best thing that's happened to the king so far is he's just got a good night's rest. And that is how the body can sometimes recover. But clearly, he's not better yet. So what do you do after this latest attack? Firstly, continue bleeding the king. Secondly, continue purging the king. Thirdly, prescribe the following medicine recommended by one of your colleagues. The spirit of human skull, 40 drops, taken in an ounce and a half of cordial julep. Or abandon all the treatments because clearly none of them are working. So, first of all, why is it likely that the king has begun to recover? Note that down. And also note down which treatment you recommend. Pause the video while you do this.
So, actually, the doctors recommended all three of those top three treatments. Yes, they really are throwing everything at him now. So record the actual treatments used and explain which medical theories these are based upon. Pause the video while you do that. Yet again, this is related to the theory of the four humours, but treatment number three is slightly different. Remember that some herbal remedies really did work, but this is more of an example of a quack remedy, the sort of thing that an apothecary might mix together for you which would sound very impressive, but would be rather doubtful as to what it would do for you. Apothecaries have been around since the Middle Ages, and so again, this is not really an example of progress. At least they were trying something new, although it would appear that actually the king just needed leaving alone. Decision 6. The king's health is worsening rapidly. The physicians are undecided about whether to use these remedies. Every other hour, give two scruples, which in modern terms means two and a half grams, of bezoa stone, a green stone found in the stomach of Persian goats. Also, a medicine mixed from herbs and extracts from all the animals of the kingdom. Might sound a little bit unlikely, that one there, but that's what they recorded. What do you recommend to your fellow, fellow doctors? Do you recommend to use the bezoa stone? Or do you recommend to use the herbal animal medicine? Or do you recommend the use of both? So, firstly, in what ways do these treatments show that the doctors were becoming desperate? Let's see what they really did. They actually used both. So, record the actual treatments used, explain why this does in fact show that the doctors are becoming desperate, but explain which medical theories these might be based upon. Pause the video while you complete this. So clearly these sorts of uh, quack remedies are similar to the ones that we looked at earlier with the extract of human skull. There's not an awful lot more that the doctors could try apart from just leaving the king alone, and perhaps they should have done that. Decision number seven. The king is dead. Oh dear. So what are you going to do now? Do you recommend that the doctors send the palace a bill of for payment, knowing that they all did their best and that medicines are expensive? Do they try and see the new king, James II, so that you can blame the other doctors for the death of Charles II? Or do you order a carriage and drive towards the coast as fast as you can? Your first task then, which option seems most likely and why? Pause the video while you explain your answer. Well, what they actually did was they sent the palace a bill of payment. They did do their best, and they used the best possible medical treatments available at the time, even if they might seem pretty ridiculous to us now. Not only that, but actually the palace would have happily paid, believing that the doctors had done their best. The next one, well, that might leave you open to certain accusations, and ordering a carriage would certainly make it look like you had poisoned the king and were trying to get away, so a pretty bad idea. So record what actually happened. And what does this tell us about the availability and quality of doctors' treatments in the 1600s? Pause the video while you note down your answers for those questions. OK, let's move on. So what happened to Charles II? It is now thought that Charles II suffered a minor stroke, and today he would have most likely have made at the very least a partial recovery. The cures tried by his doctors likely did much to speed how quickly he died. But their treatments were based on the best medical thinking available at the time, and they were mostly based upon the thinking of Hippocrates with the theory of the four humours, and Galen, and also herbal and traditional medicines. So your task then. Review your work on ancient and me medieval medical theories, if you need to. If you've not done a, a study on ancient medical beliefs, then have a look at the lesson I provided in the medieval section of this playlist. Firstly, explain which ideas of Hippocrates, Galen and herbal medicine were used. Secondly, explain why the treatment of Charles II shows that there was little progress in the knowledge of what caused disease in the Renaissance. Pause the video here and complete those tasks. So, there is a huge amount of the theory of the four humours being employed in Charles II's treatments, but also some elements of the theory of opposites as well. So, for example, if they recognised that perhaps there was something wrong with the king's brain, then blistering his scalp might be related to that. 
But the herbal medicines as well would have been pretty common sense and the sort of things that would have been tried regularly for all sorts of diseases. But this does show that there was little progress in the treatment of medicine because actually if the king had fallen ill in the later Middle Ages they very likely would have used virtually identical treatments. Things hadn't really got better. Now a chance to make some improvements to your answers from the last tasks. I recommend that you do this. Firstly Hippocrates. Clinical observation and diagnosis was used widely. The doctors recorded the king's treatments and symptoms over time in detail. Unsuccessfully though. Also the four humours. Many of the treatments such as bleeding, blistering and purging were based on balancing the humours. Also Galen. The theory of opposites. Some of the treatments such as the pigeon droppings may have been intended to draw out poisons through the use of opposites and fighting miasma with strong smells. Remember miasma means bad air. And herbal and traditional medicines. Apothecaries. The exotic ingre ingredients and medicines with quack ingredients like human skull and bezoa stone are typical of the apothecary mixtures of the time. Alright, pause the video here and add the necessary extra detail and facts to your existing answers based upon the last tasks. Press play when you're ready to continue. So, so far it's been really quite bad news. There's been very little in the way of medical improvements. But perhaps that was going to change in some ways, and we are going to have a look at one of the more successful doctors of his time now. During the Renaissance many ideas from the Middle Ages were still being followed, however one doctor, and he's pictured there, Thomas Sydenham, was trying to make progress. Now we will investigate Sydenham's contribution to medical history. How much of his work represents change and progress? How much actually represents continuity? Thomas Sydenham, 1624 to 1689. Record his name and his dates of birth and death in your notes. So Thomas Sydenham was known as the English Hippocrates. He trained at Oxford University, but the English Civil War cut his studies short in the 1640s. Sydenham decided that each disease was different and therefore it needed to be identified. Following on from this, each disease also required a different cure. This was similar to Hippocrates thinking, but it had some subtle differences. Sydenham believed in observation and diagnosis like Hippocrates and letting nature take its course with illness rather than trying every cure at random. Think about how different this is to the approach that was taken with Charles II. He also encouraged taking the pulse as a method of diagnosis, recognising that a fast or slow pulse might be a sign of ill health. He also wrote an important book, Observations Medicae, this was published in 1676 and was printed widely and widely shared. He also discovered Sydenham's cholera, a particular disease, and showed the difference between scarlet fever and measles, two diseases that have similar symptoms and many people thought were basically the same thing. However, Sydenham did not believe that God caused disease, only that God gave people the ability to recognise and fight it. This is a marked difference to earlier times, when people might be more prepared to simply accept what happened as God's will, rather than trying to fight the disease. Some tasks then. Firstly, describe Sydenham's work with detailed notes. As a minimum, you'll need five key facts, but more if possible. Secondly, which of Sydenham's ideas were similar to earlier ideas? Thirdly, which ideas were new? Give at least three. Explain the importance of Sydenham's attitudes to religious explanations for disease. And lastly, as an extension, why might Sydenham's studies being cut short have actually made him a better doctor? Pause the video while you complete those tasks. So let's have a think. Hopefully you've got enough detailed notes on what Sydenham actually con contributed now. So which of Sydenham's ideas are similar to earlier ideas? Well, remember, observation and diagnosis is similar to what Hippocrates suggested. That's probably the biggest one. Also, he wasn't the first person to write a book. This is something that had been done before and proved to be a good way of spreading your ideas. What might be new then? Well, this idea that every single disease is different is a new one. Although diseases are presented differently in different ways, the idea that there were actual specific causes of these diseases which were different was quite a new one. Also, this idea of taking the pulse was a new idea as well something that is still done by doctors even today. We have his new discoveries about specific uh, different diseases like Sydenham's cholera, scarlet fever and measles too. 
So, what about the importance of his attitudes to religious explanations? Well, these would make doctors more likely to try and fight the disease rather than saying, well, God wants this and we shouldn't interfere with what God has chosen to do. And that is quite a marked departure from the way that people have thought before. So why might Sidenham's studies being cut short have made him a better doctor? Remember that by cutting his studies short, he would have had to th find things out more for himself rather than just being told them. This meant that he was more likely to be inquiring and try and find new ways of thinking rather than relying on many of the old and mistaken ideas that universities would teach training physicians. So, although most of the time the experts these days absolutely know what they're doing, this is a much earlier time. It probably helped Sydenham that he wasn't being told to just unquestioningly believe everything that was in the medical textbooks. So does this represent the beginning of something called the Enlightenment? In 1660, the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge was established. This is now better known as the Royal Society. This was a sign that the king was supporting the development of new scientific ideas. Scientists would discuss new ideas in science and medicine, but also challenge the old ones. They would carry out experiments and use new technology like microscopes. And the Royal Society's findings were widely published in printed books and journals. The age of the Enlightenment, where people felt free to question religious explanations for scientific ideas, was about to begin, although there is some way to go yet before it makes a huge difference. Some follow-up tasks then. Firstly, describe how the Royal Society challenged old ideas. Then explain how challenging old ideas might bring about medical progress. What aspects of new technology assisted the work of the Royal Society? And, as an extension, the Royal Society's motto is nullius in verba, meaning take nobody's word for it. What does this motto tell us about the quite modern and scientific nature of the group? Pause the video while you answer those, ta those tasks. Alright, hopefully you've got everything that you need now. Challenging these old ideas means that more and more new ideas are going to be found, but also accepted. And so people will finally move away from some of the wrong ideas that Galen and Hippocrates had said, and which had been followed for thousands of years. The new technology also assisted them, with printing meaning that they could spread their work far and wide. And microscopes, consider the implications of that. Although it would be some time yet, and we're talking two centuries here, before germs are identified as the cause of disease, at long last, microscopes provide the means by which they might at least be discovered. And how about that motto? Nullius in verba. Take nobody's word for it. Well, this is very much the modern basis of scientific inquiry. You don't take anybody's word for it just because it's been said before. You demand that it is proved, that it is tested through experimentation, and that you question it if you find that it is wrong. So the problems of medicine have been solved, right? Well, not quite. Ordinary people, and many doctors, still believed in superstitious and ancient ideas about disease. Theories like miasma were still thought to cause illness. And people still didn't know what caused disease, meaning that many treatments remained ineffective. As an example, the Great Plague of 1665 was treated in very similar ways to the Black Death over 300 years earlier. And in a future lesson we'll be having a look at that in far more detail. So to follow up this, why would the work of Sydenham not have improved things like public health very much? Do these facts suggest change or continuity in medicine? Explain your view. And as an extension, what me measures were likely to be taken in the Great Plague of 1665? Consider what you might already know about the Black Death. What do we think then? Thomas Sydenham's work was quite important, and it certainly helped doctors become more modern and still use the very best that uh, was provided by Hippocrates' teaching. But it wouldn't have done much for public health because that's much more about the prevention of disease rather than just the understanding of it. Do these facts change, suggest change or continuity in medicine? Well, there is some change, but there is a huge amount of continuity too, and you will need to recognise this. And it tends to be that there is change in some of the practices of medicine and some of the understanding of anatomy, but a great deal of continuity in terms of what people actually thought caused disease. So what measures are likely to be taken by the Great Plague of 1665? Well, in a future lesson, I'll be able to correct you on those things there. But many of them were very similar to the Black Death. 
so does Thomas Sydenham deserve the title of the English Hippocrates? Explain your point of view. Pause the video while you do that. So, on the one hand, yes, perhaps he does. He built on Hippocratic ideas and improved them, like believing in natural causes of illness and by observing and diagnosing specific diseases. On the other hand, perhaps no. He did little to improve public health in general, and he did not understand the actual causes of disease, even if he did make improvements in identifying the different illnesses. For a final time then, pause the video and improve your answer if you need to, but I'd also recommend you, you write down the alternative uh, in interpretation as well, so that in the future you can balance your answers and challenge your ideas. Once you've done that, that will be the end of the lesson. I'll say thank you very much for watching, I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, give the video a like and subscribe to the channel for more of the same. Thanks very much, and good health!